So I'm Jeff Greenfield. Um, I'm a neurosurgeon here at Wild Cornell, where we are today. This is um, part of the Wild Cornell Medical Center, New York Presbyterian Hospital. I am a um, pediatric neurosurgeon and by training. I've been here at this medical center my whole life for training, including medical school and residency, and now for 10 years as a neurosurgeon. Um, one of the really unique aspects about our hospital is that while I am a pediatric neurosurgeon, this is not a freestanding pediatric hospital, like one of the places I trained. And so um, I've had the opportunity to start seeing adults and taking care of adults, and my practice has expanded to what I term transitional neurosurgery, which is really pediatric-like diseases that have extended beyond the pediatric age group. So I take care of adults with Chiari, obviously, as you guys know, but also those associated conditions like adults with tethered cord and syringomyelia that really have no other home within neurosurgery. There are spinal, adult spinal neurosurgeons who want nothing to do with patients with tethered cord and syringomyelia. So it really has become the domain of pediatric neurosurgeons. So it's been kind of a wonderful mix here of having an integrated hospital because I'm able to see the whole spectrum. And my practice now is uh, essentially evolved into about a 50-50 practice between pediatric and adults. Don't ask me which I like better. But this is, um, this is kind of where I've, uh, my career has evolved and my relationship with the CSF is something that has grown over the years. Um, recently invited onto the Scientific Advisory Board because we're so involved um, in um, our patient population with respect to gathering data, looking at trends, trying to understand new and um, unique ways to define our populations. And so um, we're really excited to share this with the CSF and with our audience whenever possible. The other caveat that I'll give here today is that I think you know, we're all learning about this still. And so this is, I think, very tongue in cheek being called Ask the Expert, but that's certainly that was not my idea in terms of the name. I think that I, <laughs> I think that I, I continue to learn a lot from my patients every day. I continue to make mistakes, and I think that it's part of the process of being open and understanding that this is a disease that we don't completely understand. Um, and as long as we can be honest with our patients and do the best advocacy that we can, um, hopefully we understand that um, this is a process we're in together. So. Thank you all for coming and braving the cold tonight. Yeah. In New York City, it's currently eight degrees, which is not as bad as the Midwest, where I think it's still negative 30 or negative 40 in some places. Um, yeah. Rest? <laughs> I'm, I'm grateful we're not there, but anyone who's WebExing in from over there, I hope you're inside. We okay. feel you. <laughs> so I'll just quickly introduce myself. I didn't know I was going to be doing this today. <laughs> My name is Caitlin. I am with the Chiari and Stringomyelia Foundation. I run programs and research, so I'm in contact with Dr. Greenfield a lot. Um, so I'm kind of glad I get to do this today. I kind of thought about it while we were sitting there that I think I'm going to take a couple of the questions that people had sent in prior Every, and intersperse them with questions from the audience. And I think the easiest way to do it, rather than getting up and handing everyone a mic, is to, you'll ask the question, I'll just repeat it into the microphone so that everyone at home, hopefully, who can now hear us, yay, okay, will hear. <laughs> um, so I guess I'll get just started. Uh, I'll read off some questions. Can, so. I, can I say one other thing yes, before, before you start the questions? Mm -hmm. The reason why I thought this would be a, a good format um, just in terms of the, the usual format that we use for these is to give a lecture, you know, and I've you know given dozens of these lectures, and um, I'm never quite sure what the right level is for the audience, what the questions really are that the audience is interested in. I think that what I might be interested in talking about scientifically or something that I think is cool or pushing the field ahead may not be what most people want. And so I said, let's just see what people want to talk about. And in reality, I, th I think I was actually right on this one because I think the questions were nothing that I really would have gone off and given a talk about at a scientific meeting, but rather things that really uh, are nuts and bolts for a lot of the patients. I just recently had, uh, I had gave, um, well, I had the opportunity to think about this in the context of a patient I was seeing in the preoperative area last week or two weeks ago for a surgery, for a Chiari surgery. And I had the consent and I was handing it to them and I was like, do you have any questions? And she asked me, she's like, so what exactly are we doing? And I was like really taken aback because we had spent a good hour in the office going over this. 
And, um, and so obviously I patiently went through the whole thing one more time. But I think that you know maybe we don't necessarily appreciate sometimes the level um, at which the complexity at which this is really um, reached in terms of Chiari and the nuances and the sort of the different types of surgical decisions that different providers are making. And so this maybe is an opportunity for us to say take it down a notch, not to dumb it down, but to simplify and really get at what are the questions that are really at the heart of how we're making our decisions, um, how we take care of our patients before and after surgery, not so much the technical details of how we do surgery and, and those types of things, which you could go online. I'm trying to find lots of talks about how to, how to do QRI surgery. But um, so I try to focus in on the questions. Thank you to everyone who's sent in the questions. I will keep these questions handy. We've talked about maybe doing kind of this on a regular basis, even if it's a couple of questions once a week and posting them on Facebook so that we can get to all of them. There are 50 or so questions sent in, so we're only going to get to a handful of them. I try to focus on those that I think were repetitive in the sense that many people ask them. So um, hopefully we, we get to a good sampling and I hope this is a fun format for everybody. So with that. Perfect. Okay. That actually sets up the one of the questions pretty well, so I'm going to go to that. Um, hi, Dr. Greenfield. Uh, you're my surgeon for two surgeries. Um, now that it has been around four years, my question, her question is really about post-surgery. So what are post uh, behavior suggestions that you recommend what should they what should patients do after surgery what should a patient expect one year out of surgery and I guess six months prior and when is it time to come back uh, if you're having symptoms even years later what are the symptoms that are worrisome enough that you should come back to a surgeon to get reevaluated for maybe potentially surgical right. intervention so that was like eight questions? Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, so it touches on a couple of really interesting points. One of them is something that Dorothy brought up, which is our registry at the CSF, which is really important for answering a lot of these questions. I mean, I can give you my perspective on uh, an answer to that question, but I think that we don't necessarily have the answers to four years, eight years, 12 years out from surgery on a longitudinal basis. We have lots of anecdotes. Um, what we have is a lot of skewed data because of the fact that our patients who don't do well um, or don't have lasting relief from surgery take up the overwhelming majority of our time, whereas the patients who do well disappear um, in general. Um, and so I think that that's one conundrum. The second conundrum is that kids and adults do very differently. And we were talking about that just before we went on, on live, that the population of patients with Chiari is very much dichotomous and there's kids um, and then there's adults and those are two different diseases in my mind completely um, and how kids respond to surgery and the follow-up and how adults do are also two different kind of management schemes in my mind. In general I see patients you know a week or so after surgery I get scans at three months and then I see them again in a year and I would say that the vast majority of my pediatric patients that's it for the most part and then if they have new symptoms after that, then it's time to come back in because kids tend to do really well. It's a defined problem. They haven't had symptoms for a long time. For adults, I think, and I think this is an adult who is writing in, this is a lot more tricky because it really depends on the underlying um, condition that the patient had when they started, um, what their comorbid factors are with respect to other things that are associated with Chiari, um, how their symptom relief was in the first place. Um, and expectations that are set up. I think you know part of the burden really lies on me or the surgeons that you're seeing out there to set up realistic expectations. And I think that's one place where we probably um, can do even a better job. I think we just don't know sometimes who's going to be a perfect responder and who's not. And so we would love it if everyone did great. Um, and we try our best to figure out those comorbid situations beforehand. But I think sometimes we still fail at that. Um, and so if patients are not doing well, they should be coming back to see us. Um, you know, typically we try to give it six months, give it a year to see what the resolution will be. But if that's not the case, then we start looking into, was the surgery adequate? Do we need new scans? Is there a secondary condition? Do we miss EDS? Did we miss hydrocephalus, even though we look for those things? Um, and, and then we can go from there. But I think that that's generally the philosophy that I use. That's good. It actually sets up another question, so I'm flipping through to try and find it. Uh, of course. Oh my God, 
I'm losing it. <laughs> All right. Well, the gist of it was, if you're assessed for EDS, POTS, everything under the sun, and you're found to not have those things in whatever clinical assessment that is, um, what is the surgical option there? Or is there one? Or how else would that patient's symptoms be treated? Do you mean uh, in the setting of if, PR, if, right? In the setting of PR, yes. Um, I think what the question is really asking is, number one, um, how exhaustive is the preoperative evaluation for those comorbid factors for Chiari patients? Um, I, th I think that really gets to the heart of, well, when do you go from being a Chiari surgeon to being someone that's sort of, you know, talked about in the Chiari community because you understand all these comorbid features? And whether or not you are exhaustive or not is really a, a contentious question in some ways. I think that um, I think about it with every patient that I see. I think about, does this sound like Chiari? Does it sound like a pseudotumor problem? Does it sound like EDS? Let me give you an example. I saw a patient today, just it's fresh off my mind. I saw a 51-year-old female who was diagnosed with Chiari in 2004. And she was told that she had three or four millimeters of herniation and was kind of dismissed and said not to worry about it. She's recently had worsening since about August. The symptoms are terrible. And um, she came to my office this afternoon, we looked at the films, and the Chiari got worse, right? This is kind of what she knew. She's like, the Chiari's worse. Um, I saw a surgeon here, no name. They said, I definitely need surgery. I said, what do you mean the Chiari got worse? I, you know, and I was sort of playing with her. I said, I thought Chiari was a congenital disorder, isn't it? Because I knew she was well-educated. And she said, yeah, but it went from four millimeters to 12 millimeters. I said, how does that happen? She said, oh, I thought it gets bigger as you get older. I was like, no, that's not how this works. Um, and so we started talking about this idea that like, well, this could be a problem with pressure inside the head. And I was sort of going down this whole path towards maybe if your head is, you know, a fixed volume, you've got increased pressure, the brain gets pushed down. And that's kind of where I thought it was going. And then she pulled out these reports of a spinal MRI that she'd had three years ago. And she said, well, what about this? And she had these large spinal cysts that by all indication looked like they were leaking CSF. And so in, in the setting of a 30-minute you know, conversation, she went from my QR is getting worse to I have intracranial hypertension to now I have a CSF leak. And now she's scheduled for a myelogram next week. And I'm absolutely certain that she has a CSF leak or a fistula that's contributing to further pull downward herniation of her tonsils. So, can I do a myelogram on every patient that comes to see me for a Chiari? Of course not. I can't do an MRV, spinal MRI, you know, intracranial pressure monitor. I mean, first of all, you know, there are risks associated with all these. Secondly, no insurance company would approve 90% of those that I would request. And so you have to be targeted. And I know that for patients where things don't work and you find out later, oh, I had this, why don't you figure that out? Well, guess what? There's no genetic test for EDS. It's a clinical scenario. You know, why didn't you do a pressure monitor? Well, I can't drill a hole in everybody's head. And so we kind of have to figure out as best we can with the clinical information, the data that we have in front of us, and our experience, what we really think is the direction that this is going um, in terms of a, a clinical story. And so um, I definitely am a better diagnostician today than I was five years ago. And I think I'll be better in five years than I am now because I think every patient adds an experience to kind of my memory bank of this looks familiar. So when this patient came in today, this, this did not seem like Chiari to me at all. I knew it wasn't Chiari, but I thought it was probably gonna be high pressure and it turns out it's likely low pressure. So I think even for someone who sees dozens of patients a week, this is still something that we can get wrong. So this actually, it, this is more on the side of syringomyelia, but it, it gets to what we were just talking about. Is it possible to see evidence of a syrinx in diagnostic imaging after resolving itself, quote unquote, organically. Do they leave a trace that could be visible to a radiologist if they're looking for it? So if there's that bias that they're looking for it already. And is that normal? Is it normal for a syrinx to disappear and come back? And what's the likelihood of that? So syrinx is a really interesting topic that I think gets ignored a little bit in the CSF name. Um, we're actually uh, just finishing up a study looking at all of our Syrinx patients uh, over the past 10 years looking at the, the rates of resolution and more importantly the percent reduction in the syrinx. One of the questions that we have that I always wondered was 
well, how come you can do the same operation in one patient will have complete resolution of the syrinx, the exact same operation, the patient will have a 50% reduction or a 10% reduction. And so while overall, I think I could sort of say that my numbers are about somewhere in the 80 to 85% range for getting improvement of a syrinx after surgery, there are still 10% that don't get better and one or two patients that have gotten worse despite what I think is the optimal approach for all of these. And so I think we don't necessarily completely understand what's going on. I think my best understanding to answer the question, not avoid it, is that just like in the brain um, with hydrocephalus, um, there's, a, there's a role for the elasticity and the turgor of the brain and the ventricles. And we know that children and even adults who have severe hydrocephalus, even with optimal shunting or rerouting of the fluid within the brain don't necessarily collapse their ventricles down and that's related to the stiffness of the ventricles and the turgor of the brain and I suspect that's the same thing that goes on in the spinal cord with the syrinx. It might also, uh, there also might be a relationship with the length of time that the syrinx has been there. You know, kind of just an easy metaphor for it is just thinking about like stretching out the waistband on a pair of sweatpants. I think the longer it's been stretched out, the less likely it is to snap back and so someone who's had a syrinx for 20 years versus six months, I think the likelihood of improvement is probably just, you know, intuitively going to be better if the syrinx hasn't been stretching on those neural fibers in the appendum for as long. But I think some of that data will start to come out from these databases and hopefully we'll learn more about that. So just to bounce back on that, is the same true for Chiari? So the um, compression of the brainstem, is that something that could be concerning long term? I know we sort of talked about it before, but if you could... Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think we address it directly. I think sort of on the side it was sort of inferred, but I, th I think absolutely that one of the concerns that patients, parents often have is, well, what's the, what's the effect, what's the long-term effect of not doing surgery? Aren't I putting my child at risk by letting the brainstem be compressed or allowing there to be a mild hydrocephalus or stretching of the cranial nerve or whatever it might be or syrinx? Um, isn't it going to be too late if I do something? And how do I know when it's the right time to do surgery? Um, and I think that's a problem that we um, encounter a lot in the adult population. I think I'm, I'm a little bit more comfortable in the pediatric population allowing symptoms to persist a little bit longer because they always do tend to respond and bounce back. We have a little bit of a cushion knowing that just the, the natural history of children and their plasticity affords us that luxury. In adults, it's a little harder, and so when I take care of adults with tethered cord, who are some of my most challenging patients, um, we really do talk straight off the bat about this is designed to stop progression of symptoms. If you get any improvement in your urologic function or you know, in your spasticity, that is fantastic. That's icing on the cake, but this is not a restoration surgery at the age of 50 or 60. At the age of five or six, yes, we're hoping for a great result, and so I think, again, to get back to the original question, the length of time and the compression, I think all plays a role, um, but it, it all is sort of tempered by severity and age and length of symptoms. Okay, so I think if anyone has a question that bubbled up in their mind, I can take one from the audience, or is there any online that maybe, I mean, no pressure guys. <laughs> Anything? Oh, go ahead. I just had a question about um, EAC pediatric patients recovering post-op. Um, I find that there's some kids that are just two days, they're up and out of here, and then there's the other kids who have a really tough time. Um, so two-part question. A, what kind of expectations are set? And B, are there any indicating factors that would make it potentially go one way or another related to their medical symptoms? Okay, so the question to repeat for everybody at home is pediatric patients post-op a, what are the expectations for doing better or worse after surgery? And are there, B, any extenuating factors or something about those children in particular that they will or won't do better after surgery? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. I think that's really um, a key part of where we've gotten better as surgeons is understanding that our role doesn't necessarily end once the patient gets rolled out of the operating room. And so... One thing that we've done, um, at least at Well Cornell, and I think a lot of other institutions have done similar um, initiatives, is to really think about a pain protocol that starts before the OR and extends all the way through their stay. Um, it's been really effective on the adult side to start with, just to sort of start with the adults, and I'll get back to your pediatric side. 
On the adult side, we have an instituted pain protocol that starts preoperatively with a, a, a cocktail of medications. Patients get methadone intraoperatively, which has a very, very long kind of tail so that they wake up very comfortable. And then a, a regimen of um, both a PCA and, and Valium that are sort of instituted post-op um, in the intensive care unit. That alone, just having an instituted policy uh, and a pain protocol has reduced our length of stay for QRI patients by over 24 hours. So that's a significant. So it usually used to be about a four day stay, now it's about a three day stay. Surgery is exactly the same. It's just that we're paying more attention to really thinking about how we can be conscientious about addressing the pain early and again, using non-narcotic means, sometimes toradol, um, sometimes intravenous Tylenol, ways that we can really address the pain without going down that narcotic route, which tends to prolong the stay and often makes side effects worse. In the pediatric population, it's a little tougher. Sometimes our, you know, our doses are smaller. There's a lot more variability in how patients will respond. A lot of the patients are narcotic naive, and so um, we expect that there'll be a little trial and error, and some of that may play into why some patients take two days and three days. One thing that you may be recognizing since you're working in the pediatric ICU is that a lot of the really young kids are actually not getting the same type of extensive surgery as the older kids or, or the adults, meaning that the infants and toddlers will often have dural sparing surgery where they just have bone removed. Those kids, as you probably recognize, sometimes leave the hospital in a day or two um, because the dura, the covering of the brain, is exquisitely innervated by nerves, and that tends to be a really painful part of the operation. So by sparing that, I think that they really minimize that. In addition, the smaller the child, the smaller the dissection, the less retraction of the muscles. You know, two-year-olds, um, you can get down to that part of the operation very, very quickly, whereas, you know, in a 180-pound teenage boy football player, you're, the dissection is going to be, you know, a whole lot different. And so I think there's some variability there. The last part is that there's just an inherent part of how people are genetically. And there are people, you know, I have children, one of them, you know, one, one, one phenotype in my house is go to school with the flu, never complain. The other phenotype is roll up in a ball and, you know, stay home for a week. And so I think that there's part of that that we can't necessarily even tell. Okay. That actually, the Dura mentioning has an interest. So my question is, why do so many QRI patients get CSF leak? Um, does it seem like the majority of CSF leak patients have a connective tissue disorder? Do they cause a faulty dura? Why open the dura at all? Is this the best treatment for um, Chiari given CSF leak risk, <laughs> I guess? Sounds like Summarize. this patient had a CSF leak. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first of all, I, I think I should, you know, I should dispel the notion that CSF leak is common. I mean, I think that probably for patients that are doing research and are getting opinions from online forums and from and speaker groups, um, I think we'll all agree that patients who have had complications tend to be more vocal and tend to be a little bit more prominent as um, voices out there. Patients who do well tend to go on with their lives and drift away, and so I think there's a little bit of a skew on that. Um, our own results suggest a 1% risk of CSF leak, so three leaks out of our last 300 patients is, is certainly you know, we'd love it to be zero, but I think there are predisposing factors. So the question is to why do, why do patients leak? Um, I think the primary reason where I see patients leaking when they come to me for a second opinion, they've had a pseudomeningocele, they've ended up with all these complications, is that I think it's usually unrecognized um, elevated intracranial pressures. So idiopathic intracranial hypertension misdiagnosed as Chiari leads to a perfect storm of complications because you are basically um, operating on a patient who probably had ten tonsillar descent from pressure problems. You open up the dura, haven't fixed the pressure problem, and expect a new suture line to heal with fluid pushing up against it. So, you know, this idea that, you know, the surgeon didn't sew the patch in correctly or they don't know what they're doing. I think that's not as accurate as it's probably just the actual comorbid condition was probably missed at the outset. I don't know if that's true or not. That's just my own philosophy because I think a lot of these patients end up doing really well with shunts, whereas the cure didn't make much of a difference. They were complicated, but once the shunt goes in or they're treated for their pseudotumor, 
the, the, the symptoms go away. And so I think that's probably, probably part of it. The earlier part of the question, which I don't want to ignore, is you know, why do we open up the dura? And I think that that's really important to address because I think that this large national study that's being done in kids with syrinx to look at the pros and cons of opening the dura or not opening the dura with respect to syrinx is really going to only answer a really small question, which is that population of kids with a certain size syrinx. You know, the question in adults and in kids um, without syrinx um, is going to remain unanswered and left for all of us in the community to figure out on our own. My own philosophy is um, I don't think that you get as good a decompression of the neural tissue without opening up the dura. Um, that's just my own philosophy. I feel like I find a lot of intradural findings that I might not have predicted on the MRI scan. I find adhesions and webs, blockages of CSF flow underneath the dura. Um, I think that you get a better restoration of a cerebral spinal fluid flow if you do that. Um, and so I think for a 1% risk of CSF leak, the advantages massively outweigh that small risk, which can be easily managed. So I think that's going to be a question that is still going to be debated for years to come, unfortunately. So that also, this is great, they just keep going. <laughs> it goes to the next question. How does the presence of an arachnoid cyst level uh, uh, affect the decision to operate or brainstem compression? How does that affect the decision to operate? Um, but I guess to start with, what is an arachnoid cyst and um, what is in loose terms of a definition of brainstem compression and how does that affect your decisions to do surgery? So um, all these patients are getting in like multiple questions. That was they're very I know, sneaky. They're really long. <laughs> so the arachnoid cyst question first. I think let's take that separately. So arachnoid cysts are essentially an outpouching of a normal tissue plane. The arachnoid is a kind of a very thin veiled web that invests over the entire surface of the brain in cerebral spinal fluid spaces. And an arachnoid cyst is essentially a, a, an area of trapped fluid within a web or membrane of arachnoid. And this comes up occasionally because sometimes you get arachnoid cysts in and around the posterior fossa, which is the area where the cerebellum lives. And so a mass lesion in the posterior fossa can force the cerebellar tonsils down and give the appearance of a Chiari when in fact the problem is actually an underlying lesion. So I think about arachnoid cysts the same way that I would a patient with hydrocephalus or a patient with a brain tumor, both of whom may present with tonsillar herniation. So Chiari is defined as tonsillar herniation is really not accurate. Tonsillar herniation is just tonsillar herniation. It can be from anything. It can be from an arachnoid cyst or hydrocephalus or a brain tumor, or it can be from Chiari, which really is restriction of the posterior fossa. It's really uh, a morphometric analysis of the skull itself and the tonsils herniate as a secondary result. So an arachnoid cyst can make that worse, but I think you have to take that independently. And if you think that the arachnoid cyst being treated will help with the herniation, that's great. Usually I think they're incidental in the majority of cases and you have to take the QRI sort of it's on its own. Part two of the question about the brainstem compression um, is really important and I think that that's one of my kind of my own pet projects and something that I'm looking at is how to really understand symptoms that relate to the medulla. That's the brainstem and how can we understand better symptoms that relate to the brainstem in patients where they may not have a lot of tonsillar herniation um, or they may have received opinions from other neurosurgeons that, well, it's just not that bad. It doesn't reach the criteria for Chiari. And so we presented this at the CSF meeting last year, and we have a paper that we're submitting um, very shortly looking at kind of a new definition for a subpopulation of patients where brainstem compression can be defined based on not how far down the tonsils are herniating, but rather how ventral the tonsils are pushing. Because ventral, meaning in front of, is really the relationship between the cerebellum and the brainstem. So not to get too technical, but it's not all about the length. It's not all about the measurement of how far down the tonsils are, but really how much the brainstem is being compressed and how much the nerves that are coming out from the brainstem are being impacted by those tonsils every time the heartbeat and the tonsils impact down there. So I think understanding what brainstem compression means really gets back to understanding what the brainstem does and thinking carefully about which of the symptoms can really be related 
to those nuclei and those nerves that are coming out of the brainstem and making that connection intellectually or, or, or based on neuroanatomy rather than just based upon a simple measurement that's been kind of outdated for 20 years. Okay, so I'm gonna ask another question from the audience after this one so I can get your brains working. <laughs> um, so this question, I always see Chiari, Chiari patients asking for help, saying the PA, the office, the surgeon, they all give con conflicting advice on post-operative care. Um, the last thing you want after making a big decision for surgery is to trust someone uh, to feel like they're neglecting you or not communicating appropriately with these really difficult things causing unnecessary stress. So th this is also kind of a two-part question, sorry. <laughs> uh, should there be standard testing for all Chiari patients that they get checked for these comorbidities before surgery? And then after surgery, how can patients and providers really maximize communication post-operatively to avoid that conflicting advice and make sure that there's like a clear yeah. plan for post-surgery care? Yeah, I think that's an awesome question. And I think, um, you know, that, that question is born out of patients who have had difficult recoveries and have not had optimal um, recoveries from what was maybe predicted preoperatively. And I think that that gets back to Part of that question gets back to what I discussed before, which is how do you exhaustively rule out every possible comorbid condition in a, in a patient population? I mean, the answer is you really can't. You can do the best you can by listening to the clues and trying to figure this out. But I think the more important part of this that we've learned as we've gained experience is really just trying to figure out how do we adequately set expectations? How do you draw that confidence between the patient and yourself about, well, what are we trying to achieve here? You know, I'll often see a patient post-operatively and um, I'll walk into the office and the first thing I'll hear is, these are the things that are bothering me. And then I'll go back to my note from before surgery and I'll say, these are the 10 things we talked about before surgery. I'll say, oh, those are all great. Those are fine. But it's focusing on what's not right. And so, you know, that's a hard part. I mean, patients want to get better. and we want to do the best we can while minimizing risk. And so there's always a fine line that we have between you know, being too aggressive and being um, too passive. And so you know, I find that's the hardest part of my job is trying to figure out where that line is. You know, I find that I can second guess myself about, well, should I have done more in that patient because they really didn't get better versus that patient where they have a complication, you think maybe I shouldn't have gotten so aggressive. And so no matter what you do, you can be second guessed in this field because it's not black and white. This is not Chiari surgery and being you know, someone within this field, I've gained the appreciation that this is probably more difficult in some ways than the other parts of my practice where you deal with brain tumors, for example, right? And so you have a brain tumor and it, the MRI scan shows whether or not you're successful and it's out or not. Um, in Chiari, the MRI scan is only part of it. If the patient's not better, then your surgery wasn't successful, whether or not you were technically successful or not. Um, so that's tricky. In terms of like improving communication, I think that was you know, part one of the question. I think that gets back to a conversation we were having before we went live, which is um, where do Chiari patients go for help? I think you asked the question, and you asked the question, for all these patients that have had surgery and they have residual symptoms, Neurosurgeons might understand the disease best, but once they feel like they've exhausted what they can do, it becomes very difficult to become the primary caregiver for patients who really need some hybrid neurologist, physical therapist, psychiatrist, you know, pain management doctor. I don't know who that is. Ultimately, I think you know, trying to develop a um, core of physicians who work together, which is kind of what we've tried to do at Chiari Care, is ultimately the best idea. Technically, in the world of modern medicine, it doesn't really work. I, I would like to be able to say, I don't think this requires surgery, why don't you go next door and see my neurology colleague, and that, that would be like my dream. The reality is, we ask them to see neurology and they get an appointment for next May to see them, right? And in the meantime, what do you do? Well, maybe go see pain management, maybe do some physical therapy, you know, because the alternative of saying, well, let's do more surgery, that's not appealing either. You don't want to, you know, sort of dive down that road. And so patients sometimes get lost. We're surgeons, we want to do the best. We, I really think that we try really hard, and I think my colleagues around the country will all echo this, 
but figuring out where patients go after surgery is one of our biggest challenges and something that I think I still struggle with. And so I think hopefully we continue to do better with that, but I think that question comes out of a real need. And I, I can just say, speak on our behalf, I think that's something we've been actively trying to do is kind of bridge communication. We're trying to do more, consider Chiari, so uh, CME lectures to, for medical professionals of various specialties and really try to make sure everyone's talking together <laughs> um, to implement a care plan that works for everybody. Um, so I'll t okay, we have someone from online. Go ahead. Going a little bit off of that, um, considering a syrinx um, appearing after Chiari decompression, um, how long would you watch that and wait, or what symptoms might you pay more attention to? Okay, so to reiterate, sorry, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, a syrinx that, that occurs after Chiari decompression. So you've had a Chiari surgery and then all of a sudden you have a syrinx afterward. How long do you wait before you consider surgery and what are the symptoms that you would be looking for to determine if you're going to do that? Yeah, so that's an uncommon scenario and I think that um, just thinking technically about the things that can lead to a syrinx that wasn't there preoperatively, um, I would think that probably it relates to a predisposition to inflammation or scarring at the time of surgery. I think that that's probably the most likely scenario um, one of the things that we try very hard, I think you can see lots of videos online, is we really try to maintain a pristine CSF space when we're doing surgery, avoid any blood getting into the fluid because inflammation of the CSF space is something we call aseptic meningitis, which a lot of people have heard of, treated with steroids. It's really an inflammation of the CSF spaces, and I think any inflammation of those CSF spaces can lead to scarring of the CSF spaces, which is what ultimately leads to syringomyelia. So I think if you see something new after surgery that's worse, um, then I think the um, reflex would be, well, there's probably some kind of blockage that's there and would require surgery. The only caveat to that would be if the patient's asymptomatic from it, their Chiari symptoms are better and the syrinx is asymptomatic, I probably wouldn't do anything about it. I'd give it a long time to try and resolve on its own. Um, and then only when that syrinx became symptomatic would you consider um, doing surgery. Because I think one thing that we haven't really touched on tonight is you know, what to do about these asymptomatic findings that are so prevalent in the age of MRI scan. We see a lot of asymptomatic syrinx. Um, and if you have an asymptomatic syrinx and a Chiari that's found because, for example, you had a concussion, does that really mandate surgery anymore in this day and age? I think 10 years ago the answer would have been yes. And a survey sent to pediatric neurosurgeons um, about a decade ago, about 75% of neurosurgeons would recommend surgery for a patient with Chiari and syrinx who is asymptomatic. I don't know if that's the same number that you would hear these days. I think that we're a little bit more willing to observe and, and to be conservative in that respect. And so I think to get back to that question, I think that it really depends on the clinical scenario, but we may be willing to watch something like that. Anyone else? Hi. Uh, how come it's done asymmetrical herniation where one side is lower than the other? And if so, uh, what uh, risks or symptoms are associated with this condition? So the question is, um, why is a Chiari sometimes asymmetrical? So you have right and left tonsils, why it's right lower or left lower than the other? And what are the clinical implications of that, if there are any at all? I have no idea, honestly. So I, I thought maybe you could help me with this one, because I think <laughs> I, one, of, one, of our, one of our recent meetings, we actually were doing measurements of the yeah. tonsils, right? And you know they had you know a dozen or so you know really prestigious neurosurgeons around the country all measuring scans and trying to figure out whether or not there was any kind of unanimity between you know experts in the field and obviously the answer is no there's not there's a lot of variability in how we measure these things so I don't I don't know what the percentage of patients is that have asymmetric tonsils but I'll just tell you my own anecdotal experience which is that almost all patients have one side that is more herniated than the other and often one side where the tonsil is actually enlarged asymmetrically more than the other um, sometimes to the point where one tonsil completely fills the entire field um, and you don't exactly know where the midline is until you open everything up because it just looks like one big mass and it's usually the right or the left is herniated over and taken over and pushed the other tonsil off to the side. I don't know why that is. I don't know if we have any evidence to, to explain that. Um, 
what that means. I think it doesn't mean anything other than you have to think about where the tonsils are pushing and what they're compressing. And you know, again, this gets back to this idea of the brainstem and the cranial nerves really being at the heart of what Chiari surgery should be addressing and looking at the lateral compression of the cranial nerves and looking at the indentation of the brainstem and making sure that it's not about fixing the number of millimeters of descent, but relieving the compression on the brainstem and the cranial nerves and restoring CSF flow. And whether that's reducing a tonsil or doing a duroplasty, I think that doesn't matter. It just matters that you're thinking about what the symptoms are and addressing the compression that's probably causing them. Does that make sense? Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Okay, next. <laughs> tethered cord and Chiari. Can tethered cord cause Chiari due to the spinal cord being pulled down? Okay, so the question is tethered cord and Chiari. Can tethered cord, in a sense, cause Chiari by pulling down on the cerebellum? Can I pass? <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, that's a little, uh, it's a little contentious, I suspect. Um, so, Here's my philosophy on it, right or wrong. Um, I don't think in general that I subscribe to that philosophy, um, that they are so causally linked. I think there are a lot of patients who have comorbid tethered cord and, and Chiari. Um, and whether or not your symptoms get better, whether or not your Chiari symptoms get better by releasing a tethered cord, I'm not so sure. I think that. Um, my neuroanatomic understanding of things is that the tethered cord is really related to the medulla, and so you might be releasing traction on the medulla ever so slightly, but the number of cranial nerves um, and spinal nerves that are leaving the spinal canal at every level just makes it hard for me to understand how you'd get so much of a release that far away that you'd be reducing tension on the nerves and reducing QRI symptoms. I think it may be more that there's an overlap between the two of them um, and symptom relief is um, sort of blurred between the two conditions. I will say that in my population of patients where we have comorbid tethered cord and Chiari, I will almost always do tethered cord surgery first. Um, whether or not that's sort of, you know, secretly part of my brain hopes that the Chiari symptoms will get better or if it's just sort of my rational thought, which is that tethered cord surgery in general tends to be less invasive, a little bit easier to recover from, and if we can get symptom relief from that, and the QRI can be deferred, whether they get better from that, whether it's placebo or whether it's real, I think that that's the right order to do it. And so almost always do tethered cord surgery first, followed by QRI surgery. And then when you throw hydrocephalus into that, into that order, Hydrocephalus always comes first, then tethered cord, then Chiari. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then, Got it? Um, okay. Is it true that Chiari tends to show up during puberty? And if so, what is going on in the adolescent body that Chiari starts to show symptoms? This is actually one of the questions we had online, so this is even better. <laughs> um, is it true that Chiari, um, or not is it true, uh, does puberty almost turn on Chiari in a way, and why, what's going on in adolescence that it becomes so much more visible, I guess, in the population? That's a super question, and it's super hard. I don't know the answer to it. Um, I think traditionally, if we looked at demographic curves for where Chiari presents, I don't think I could necessarily support that argument that Chiari is more prevalent in teenagers. I think I've seen it more recently, a little bit of a bump in the teenage population, but for me, traditionally, it's been kind of that five to nine year range, actually, where Chiari seems to be symptomatic in the pediatric population, and then there's the adult population, you know, women in their 30s and 40s. Um, the teenagers, I, I'm not sure what it is. It could be related to growth, it could be related to um, hormones in some way. There is certainly a population of teenagers that I've seen in the past couple of years where Chiari has been precipitated by concussion. So maybe it's the influence of you know competitive sports. I think teenage years are really when the human body is most engaged in competitive sports. I mean, you don't do it when you're little, and once you leave college, you don't really do it. And so I think it's that age group where kids tend to be um, more predisposed. So that might be part of it, but I'm not sure I've seen any good literature or data to support um, a higher prevalence in teens or a link of puberty to that, but it's, it's really interesting. I just don't know the answer. Do you have a question? So, Ernie, no, uh, oh, we got an email. Oh, so, okay. Ernie M. asks, 
From a neurosurgeon's perspective, why has the medical industry failed to adopt a superior diagnostic capability of using an upright MRI versus a recumbent MRI? Mm. Okay, so this is sort of gets to what we're talking about here too. So Are we out of time? <laughs> <laughs> um, so why has the medical community not found a superior MRI scan where you're looking at it upright because naturally your anatomy is going to change if gravity's pulling down on you. And then actually one of the questions we had online was, is Cine MRI accurate and is cerebral spinal fluid flow different in standing and lying down positions? Can you have a normal flow and be asymptomatic? <laughs> Well, we have a CSF physicist yeah. here, so maybe I should He's laughing, him up. He's laughing at me. Okay, so why has the medical industry failed to improve diagnostic modalities? I think is kind of the. Um, I'm not sure I'm qualified to speak for the medical industry. I mean, I think it's more of, um, you know, the medical device industry. I mean, MRI scans are, you know, a miracle, really. I mean, it's really changed medicine in every single way. Um, I think that medical um, centers in general have not found the need to introduce upright MRI scans into their patient populations because I think the indications are probably fairly limited. We think about it in the world of neurosurgery, specifically with hydrocephalus and Chiari and syrinx, and I do firmly believe that there is an impact of gravity and position on patients. I see it every day with patients who have hydrocephalus and CSF leaks. We do know that there is an impact on um, being upright on patients with craniocervical instability, and so I think that the ability to do upright open MRI scans has positively impacted my practice but it has not infiltrated the medical community. And why that is, I'm not sure. My guess is that Cine MRI scans and CSF flow studies would be vastly different in upright MRI scans. Um, I th this has been asked recently of radiologists at my institution who I think are fantastic and world class, and they don't agree um, necessarily. And I think that, you know, we don't do them. The MRI strength for the magnets is not the same in the upright open MRI scan, so the quality is diminished and you're getting a lot more artifact. Um, so from a neuroradiologist perspective, decreasing the quality of the scans um, for limited gain doesn't seem to be an equation that um, pays off in their mind when you're talking about installing an MRI that might be five or ten million dollars and you know drilling a hole in a roof and dropping a magnet into a hospital. So. I think it's going to rely probably on smaller community hospitals, you know, physicians with niche interests in cranial and cervical instability. People have an interest in looking at this from a physics perspective or hydrodynamic perspective on the science side first to really show some proof of concept. And then if it's proven that there is really a difference, then I think that medical institutions and, you know, the community that really will be able to afford to put these machines into their institutions we'll get on board quickly, but I think that that data is lacking right now, and so that's where the gap exists. But it's a good question. So can you have normal CSF flow and be symptomatic in your experience, I guess? I'll caveat it. <laughs> well, I'm gonna answer that slightly differently, and that is, um, I'm kind of gonna answer that question as, like, as if the question was, how much um, um. importance do you put on Cine MRI scans? I think that's a question that I get asked a lot. Um, and. I think when we get trained as neurosurgeons, one of the things that we often get told is, well, we need a SIN MRI scan for Chiar. We really got to see if there's a disruption of CSF flow. And I think a huge unanswered question that I would love for sort of people to think about and, and address is the role of CSF and CSF flow around the brainstem, it's relative importance to physical compression. Right? Can you have normal CSF flow and still be symptomatic from compression? I think the answer is yes. And from my perspective, the utility of Cine MRI scan and CSF flow studies has gone from always ordering it and making sure it was part of my protocol to almost never looking at it. So that's just sort of my own philosophy on how relative importance. I think I can tell from patient symptoms and from looking at a regular MRI scan if they have CSF flow or not. I think it's a cute study. I think you know, you know, radiologists like it, and I think it's patients feel comfortable knowing that they have a specific study looking at CSF flow. But I think. Personally, I don't really utilize it in, in 
in that context because I pay so much more attention or put so much more weight on the symptoms rather than the imaging that some kind of you know concocted image looking at flow in a in a one-dimensional two-dimensional sense is not as important to me um, as we thought it might be when when the sequence was initially developed do you want to add anything uh, yeah yeah, yeah. Right, so I'm, I'm a, an MRI physicist at Wait, can you pan? Would you mind? Yeah. You're just sitting right here. Yeah, the mic is over here. <laughs> Closer to the mic. Oh, wait, Sorry, please. Mark. <laughs> yeah. Here, uh, Mark Blackshaw. I'm a, I'm a MRI physicist, so I, I, I'm very interested in in, in uh, the discussion. Um, you know, one one thing I will say is I think. Something like uh, other, there are a number of other uh, research uh, applications which look really nice, but I think we still don't know what to do with them. And I think there's also so much variability in in what they mean, in, in how much a CSF abnormality affects a patient. Um, but I think another important thing is to keep in mind is that one of the big pushes in MRI scanners these days is speed. And I think what you'll see in the next very short period, the next five years, I know the vendors are, are trying to get your routine brain down to five minutes. So we're getting to the point where we can see, as we were talking before, real-time CSF flow. And I think that's going to change uh, a lot of the, the ability to diagnose from these sort of studies. But I don't know, you know. So yeah, no, and we didn't plant them in the audience. He showed yeah. up on his own. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, and I love that answer because I think we've been experimenting with the neuroradiologists on different sequences that we think might be more useful. And looking at real-time CSF flow, these are kind of real movie-like images of the cerebral spinal fluid flow and the movement of the brain have given me a completely different view of how this entire craniocervical junction looks in real time. I think we get very, um, we get immune to the idea that the brain is in motion when we're sitting in the office looking at a screen with a patient. When we're in the OR, the brain is moving the entire time. We're operating on a moving target. Um, and when we see these Cine MRI scans, the next generation Cine, I should say, these are called true FISP or other iterations of this, you can actually see syrinxes going like this, getting larger and smaller with every heartbeat. We can see the tonsils moving up and down with every heartbeat. And so I think it's kind of hilarious when a patient says, well, my tonsils were three millimeters three years ago, and they're four millimeters now. It's like, well, they were three millimeters six seconds ago, and they're seven millimeters now. It's, <laughs> it's, it's actually real time. These things move. And so I think we can't be too wet to the idea that things are static, and, and the results of what we see on a single uh, image are really just kind of, you know, maybe misleading us a little bit more than we think. So I think the next few years will be really exciting and uh, hopefully there'll be, you know, enough, you know, inertia to get these, you know, new machines into the hospitals. I think that's going to be the hardest part is you have a functioning MRI scan. How do you replace it with something that might be five or ten million dollars? So we'll see. But, but, but I think it's still a very important question in terms of differences in system dynamics upright and, and lying down, which is... Right, so to answer the question, you, you agree with me? You do think that there's a difference oh, in those yes. positions? Yeah, yes, 100%. okay. Thank you, okay. Yay. I wasn't confident in that answer at all. <laughs> I feel validated. <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions? Is there any online? Yes, okay, go ahead. <laughs> what is your, per, your opinion about performing or not performing a C1 laminectomy? Do I need to, do you think they can hear you or should I repeat it? I can answer it. So the question is whether or not a C1 laminectomy is always necessary when you're doing a QR surgery. Um, I think that the, the answer really depends on two things. One is obviously whether or not the compression of the tonsils goes below C1. I think in those situations, I think it's part of almost every surgeon's um, you know, decision-making process would be to remove C1. The reason why I almost always remove part of C1 at least is because I think that to do a duraplasty and really create the patch, you actually need that space to open up the dura effectively and get your instruments in there to sew and to tie. Um, you can do a dural sparing operation through a much smaller hole and spare some of C1 if the tonsils don't, don't go down that low. That's sometimes an operation we'll do on infants and very young children. Um, but to do a duraplasty, um, I think for the most part, it's usually because you've got enough herniation that C1 removal is necessary. I would say that 
um, like everything else in surgery and neurosurgery, QR surgery, you have to look at the image, you have to think about the symptoms. And there are certainly patients where I do not remove C1 because that's just not where the compression is. So it's not a reflex maneuver, it's a determined part and um, a predetermined step in the surgery based upon the imaging and the symptoms. There are three topics that I want to get to before the end of the night. So I'm just going to do one of them <laughs> um, because a couple of people have asked about it. Uh, we run into so many doctors who say Chiari is absolutely not genetic. Mm -hmm. Yet I have all four of my family members with Chiari and I know several other families with several children as well. So what do we know about the genetics basically and is there a link with connective tissue? I know there are no good answers out there on this. Um, are there any... and a caveat, an associated question someone else asked, are there any recommendations for screening in children, um, either before right. or after birth, about this condition? Right, so this is um, a really hot topic. I think it's um, really pertinent. The way, I, the way I think about Chiari and genetics is I think, the way I think most people can relate to is to think about something that's a little bit more prevalent, something like Alzheimer's disease, where um, you know, it doesn't have to be one or the other in genetics, right? So you can get a spontaneous mutation and develop a disease, or you can inherit a copy of that affected gene from your parent and have it be genetic. So it's not like it has to be one or the other. We don't know in most patients whether or not it's genetic or not unless we get an MRI scan of the parent or if the parent is already known to be symptomatic. So I don't think we know the denominator in terms of, of that percentage. What I'll say is because I see a lot of Chiari patients, I tend to see complicated patients and I tend to see families with Chiari. So my own answer to that is 100% there's a genetic component to Chiari. 100% it is possible. Not 100% of patients are, are inherited, but I still think the vast majority of patients present spontaneously due to some type of subtle defect embryologically in proteins that are involved in how the skull is formed. So, and that's part of what um, active research is pursuing. One thing that we're doing here, just as a plug for us, since I think you know, hopefully there'll be lots of families out there watching, is that we do have an open IRB now that um, is brand new, that is through a collaboration with um, the Institute for Precision Medicine here and our neurogenetics department that will be performing not just whole exome, but whole genome sequencing on families um, with neurodevelopmental diseases under which Chiari really is going to be one of our focuses. And so we're looking for families that have both Chiari in multiple generations or multiple affected siblings, so brothers and sisters, children, parents, grandparents, aunts, um, and if you feel like you fit in that rubric, just reach out to us. You can find us easily, obviously, on the internet. Email me directly, um, and we will send out kits to you. Or can we put that on the website? Absolutely. Yeah, can you yeah. send us a Thank you. For sure. <laughs> um, and um, this is purely scientific. This is not in any way meant to be diagnostic or used for treatment. It's just that we have an amazing opportunity to do really, really expensive sequencing for free. And hopefully, through these large cohorts, meaning large families, that's the best way to find genetic variability is because you find these kind of very small variants, they're easier to find when they're um, passed on from generations and they're multiple affected family members. So I know personally of at least 15 or 20 families that I'm reaching out to, but if you're out there and you know that you'd fall under this um, kind of loose categorization of multiple affected patients with Chiari, great. Even better if you have Chiari and EDS, I think that's gonna you know, be another sort of subset or cohort of patients because I think one of the other still remaining outstanding questions is what's the overlap here? Are Chiari and EDS really one disease? Are those genes just happen to be linked together and they just sit next to each other in a chromosome and they both get affected and so patients with one are likely to get both? I think those are things that will come out from the genetic studies. So I know there are active groups at both Yale and at Duke, um, at Stanford and so I think you know we're not um, in competition, we're all collaborating, and so I think the more people that are examining this, the more likely we are to find something that's interesting, and we can um, utilize each other's data to, to verify and validate our results. So we'll put the link on the website, and hopefully we can get some, some traction on this in the next year or two. We can even, we can even blast that out. So awesome. It would be amazing. Thank you. All right. So another topic that is hot. Uh, <laughs> 
PRA and cognition. Um, we have two people here who basically said speech and language was difficult for one woman's son. He was hardly speaking before, I, I assume he was very young, uh, before going to surgery, post-op, he was speaking in full sentences within hours, uh, following multi-step directions. And then another woman, her daughter, had severe developmental delays. Um, she had su successful decompression, and she's still making project progress three years out. So what, in your opinion, <laughs> is the connection between cognition and Chiari, and why would doing surgery right. help that? Well, I'd like to refer you to my <laughs> webinar last year, Chiari and Cognition. Um, so um, it's a really fascinating question, and uh, if we have a, a, a cohort of wonderful neuropsychologists here at Walt Cornell who are studying this with us. It's another open IRB that we have, so a study that if you're interested in having neuropsych testing done prior to and following Chiari surgery, we can do that for you, because we're trying to study and really quantify and understand why so many patients have Chiari fog or cognitive issues before surgery that responds to surgery. Um, the question was really focusing on kids, which is this really fascinating link between the development of language and the cerebellum. And again, it's a subject that we can talk for 45 minutes about. I think if you go to YouTube or um, the CSF website, you could probably find that link to that neurocognition talk that the neuropsychologist gave. But um, we know just anecdotally from experience that a lot of patients have you know, uh, dramatic improvement in their speech after Chiari surgery. And the reason we know that this isn't a placebo and we know this isn't just parents over-reporting is because um, in patients who have a certain type of malignant brain tumor in the brain called the medulloblastoma, we do know that a certain percentage of those patients will get cerebellar mutism, which is an inability to speak after going through part of the cerebellum. And so we know there are very, very old um, sort of maintain language centers or connections between the cerebellum and what we now perceive to be where language is housed in the brain um, in the frontal and parietal uh, cortices of the, the cerebrum that I think probably subserve some developmental role or planning role in how speech is produced. We don't completely understand it. Um, again, this talk that we, that we posted is wonderful because it goes through some of the neuroanatomy, it goes through some of the early studies um, that have tried to look at the link between um, Chiari and cognition. And for the most part, we've only been successful at testing patients afterwards, and so the ability to study patients before surgery, perform surgery, and then do the same test afterwards and really see what are those unique subsets of neurocognition that are improving is gonna be really illuminating for us and hopefully give us further insight into that. But for parents or for patients who are thinking that they're gonna do Chiari surgery and improve speech, I would I would really caution against that. Um, there are some, you know, there are some people who have put out this hypothesis about autism and cerebellum and Chiari language development. I would say that I would never personally do surgery just for language alone, but if there are other symptoms that push, you know, the, the needle towards surgery, and language happens to be one of those things that improves afterwards, it's just um, a cherry on the top because I think in general, language will develop irrespectively of the Chiari. It just may take a little bit longer. So doing surgery for that, I think, is probably probably not where we're at right now. Okay, jumping on that. Is there a connection between a searing and cognition? <laughs> that would be an even harder link for me to make. Yeah, <laughs> I think um, I mean, for higher organisms, I think linking the, the spinal cord to um, cognition is probably not there. The only way that I think Maybe the physicist will jump in here. The link might be, you know, between CSF dynamics and hydrocephalus, and I think, you know, hydrocephalus and raising your kind of pressure and cognition is well understood. This is, you know, one of the ways that patients often present with raised intracranial pressure. Normal pressure hydrocephalus in adults obviously pre you know, presents with memory difficulties. And so there may be a link between CSF dynamics in the brain and then a syrinx forming, but the syrinx itself, um, can't think neuroanatomically how that would be directly related to cognition. Anyone else have any questions yet? I can keep going. Okay, go One ahead. more? How about, uh, oh, a couple ahead. more. It's getting late for everyone. Yeah. Um, I get the impression that there's a lot of variability in terms of when something creates some symptoms and when it doesn't. The same anatomy 
right? And one patient will uh, have severe symptoms and the other one will be perfectly fine. How do you, how do you address that? How do you explain something? Yeah. So that, that's, I, <laughs> it's easy. It's easy. <laughs> I mean, we refer to that as the Chiari conundrum, right? And so, um, you know, we have these patients showing up in the office that have 25 millimeter herniations and are asymptomatic and they found it on a routine scan for something else. And then we've got these patients debilitated with minor herniations. So I don't, I don't even think I could begin to explain that. I think that all, all I can say is that um, it's multifactorial for sure. There's probably a pressure issue. There's probably a role for how the cranial nerves are being affected, how the brainstem is being compressed. Um, and there's probably some underlying factors that relate to perception of pain and symptoms that we don't even have an idea of how to understand at this point. But I think that it's, um, it's clearly at the top of our list of things that we can't adequately explain. Got your hand up over there. <laughs> so I was diagnosed with Fiori at 15, I'm 19 now, and I've had three surgeries. Um, but after my first surgery, my cousins started to discover that they have Fiori as well. Um, one of my cousins, he, they, none of them have had surgery, which I really think they should, um, especially because one of my cousins, his Fiori pushes on his optic nerve. Um, and they're telling him that eventually he will go blind. <coughs> Do you have any input on that? And maybe what the effects are when a curate does affect the offspring? Can I repeat the question? I don't know if they can hear. Yeah, I think, I think the question was sort of getting at this idea that we were discussing before, which is how do you know when to do surgery in a complicated situation? Um, how much does the MRI scan influence the decision to do surgery versus the symptoms? When is the right time to discuss surgery with your surgeon? Um, I think that because we are finding more Chiaris incidentally now, um, either because family members have it, <coughs> excuse me, um, or because they're found through an MRI scan being obtained after a concussion or a motor vehicle accident and you're like, oh, well, we have this finding now. I think that question is coming up more and more as with respect to how do we know when surgery is indicated. For every patient it's different, you know, whether it's visual symptoms, um, vertigo, nausea, numbness. I, I mean, I think Chiari is one of the most fascinating, you know, entities out there because every patient really presents differently. So I don't think it's um, really um, our job to create kind of guidelines or benchmarks for this is when surgery is required. This is kind of the nuance of what I do every day, which is you kind of have to sit and talk to the patient and get a sense for what's the duration of the symptoms. Has it gotten worse? I often ask people, what's the slope? Like, has it been getting worse dramatically? Has it been the same for five years? The natural history is usually quite slow with Chiari and you don't necessarily need to rush into things. The, the flip side to that is that there are a handful of conditions where I feel really uncomfortable with waiting and watching. And those tend to be things where there are clear abnormalities that are objectively measured on tests that show dysfunction of the brainstem. So central sleep apnea scares me. Um, and pure dysphagia scares me. Those are two things where you know that the brainstem is being impacted and you have measurable findings that can impact the quality of someone's life. Um, so there, there are those small instances, but for all those other things, the vast majority where patients are subjectively reporting symptoms, flashing black spots or numbness in my fingers or I get dizzy in the morning, it's really hard for a surgeon to sort of draw a line anywhere and say this requires surgery. It's more about that relationship and following it over time and figuring out when has the quality of life, and I say this over and over again to my patients, it's all about you. How much does it affect you? It's not about the MRI scan or anything else, but when has it really gotten to the point where you're not able to go to work, you're missing school, you're not going out with your friends, you stop working out. And those are the things that you kind of have to sort of get a feeling for over time when you, when you develop a relationship with your doctor. So does that answer that? Okay, thanks. Thanks for the question. I love that. <laughs> Is that the same recommendation you might give someone when they want to get their children tested? Oh, was that part of the question? That was part of the question, I think. Thank you, yes. <laughs> so when do you test children? Um, 
Uh, so, I don't know if my philosophy will change on this over time. I currently don't think that there's any rationale for testing children or getting MRIs for kids if they're asymptomatic. Um, that's just my own personal philosophy that's born out of my clinical practice, which is centered on the idea of symptom-based management. So, you know, to think that through, I just try to think, well, if I found a seven millimeter Chiari and the kid is asymptomatic, what's gonna change? Am I gonna change their participation in sports, ability to go to school? If it's a woman, it's gonna change their ability to have children. Or I, I don't really think that there's, that's the road to go down because you just sort of open up this kind of Pandora's box of unknown in a patient who otherwise would be asymptomatic and maybe asymptomatic their whole life. People may disagree with that, and I think there are probably people who recommend screening. Um, I don't know what other people do necessarily, but my own philosophy is um, don't unless there's something that pushes you to that point because it doesn't really add a whole lot except a lot of anxiety. And Maybe that's just because I live in New York City and there's a lot of anxiety, <laughs> but I think that, that's just sort of, I think that's, I think that's my philosophy now and, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. Okay, so there are two, actually two more topics I wanted to bring up. One of them you actually just talked about, pregnancy. So uh, bearing down, um, going through labor, what are the risks of that if you have Chiari? Um, what do you think? <laughs> I think, you know, I, I think we've been, we've been asked that question more and more recently. I think just as awareness has increased, which is great about Chiari, and I think more people have been diagnosed with Chiari because of MRI preponderance. And so the question comes up more. I think we've been um, pretty um, generous in our recommendations in that I th uh, we as a group and my partners and I have all agreed that we don't put restrictions on patients um, having a trial of labor. And that's, and that's based on uh, unoperated patients with Chiari going through labor because of just um, an absence of any data suggesting that there have been any you know, adverse outcomes from this. I think that there's always risk um, and the risk of having, you know, a Chiari become more symptomatic from labor versus the risk of having general anesthesia and a surgery to have a C-section. I don't know how you can measure those two things. I think a C-section is not as benign as, you know, we might be led to believe. And so I think um, the other risk that people con are concerned about um, is CSF leak from epidurals. And I think that that's a, a real risk. Is it common? No. But is, is it measurable? Yeah, it's, it's probably 1% or so, like everything else. It's a, it's a low risk um, and probably is you know, a self-limiting headache in the majority of patients after that. And so our recommendation is talk to your provider, talk to your OB about it. If they have any questions, they call us and we get a few questions and calls a year from OBs and we say, go through a trial. If things aren't working, if obviously if the patient becomes symptomatic, then have plan B ready. Um, but going through natural delivery usually seems to work and we've been um, very happy at um, the outcomes in the, in the vast majority of our patients. Any questions online? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> what are long-term restrictions post decompression? Long-term restrictions, okay. Um, really common question, that's a good one. Um, it varies a little bit, but in general, I try to um, adhere to a philosophy of really going back to life for the most part. I think we can maybe exclude our most complex EDS patients or patients who have had fusion surgery. That's a small you know, component of the vast majority of patients who have surgery. Kids and adults should go back to physical activity, working, um, working out. I think that's in, in general and true. And that's true for a lot of patients with EDS and uh, cervical fusions as well, but there are, are certainly slightly different criteria and restrictions and thoughts that have to go into that conversation. But um, I don't think patients should ever go into a conversation about having Chiari surgery with the idea that this is going to change their life with respect to driving or working or having a family or, or having you know those, abil those abilities that they would you know, deem normal. Um, so whether or not patients agree with that or if long-term data from the registry will bear that out, I think time will tell. But I think that that's been largely my philosophy. A lot more extreme things, you know, the general junkies, skydiving, things like that. Skydiving. Base jumping. Parkour. Parkour. Yeah.
Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, people will always ask, people love to ask about roller coasters. I feel like everyone has a roller coaster in their backyard. I just didn't know roller coasters were that popular. Um, yeah, I think that these things are likely to exacerbate symptoms in patients. And I try to be as honest, like, look, I think if you want to do a roller coaster, I think that's probably a bad idea. It's probably going to make you feel, you know, unhappy by the end of the day. But if it's important to you and you understand the consequences, it's not my job to be a parent or a babysitter. It's to give you sort of my best philosophy. And I would say that if you have Chiari and you could find something else besides going upside down in a roller coaster, find something else to do. But is it safe to do? I don't, I've never heard of anyone dying from going on a roller coaster because of Chiari. So, yeah. <laughs> I just can't answer that question. I think it's just it's just it's just common sense, and you know I think trampolines are a terrible idea as well. And so you know, the trampoline industry can hate me, but um, it's not just for Chiari. Um, we see lots of cervical spine injuries from, Chiari, from trampolines. So I think in general, it's just you know you've had major surgery, you've had major surgery on your brain. You know, be thoughtful about it. You want to go back and start having a quality of life, of course. Do you want to go out and do the the one thing that might yank your neck in the opposite direction? I don't know. It's up to you. <laughs> no, you're <missing. laughs> Any other questions from online? Sure. C1, is it safe to do contact sports? And take the posterior aspect? Yes, it is. Yeah, so the, the, the part of C1 that is removed in most surgeries is a very, very limited portion, a couple of centimeters of the posterior arch that is not connected to the joints of C1 um, where it articulates with the skull or with C2 and so it's not involved in that sense. It is attached to some muscles and some ligaments so I think to be too cavalier and say it's n not attached to anything is not true. There are small ligaments that attach it to the condyles um, but I think the amount of bone that's removed is necessary for the long-term um, success and efficacy of doing the surgery and so the downside of it is not something we've ever appreciated. There are patients who obviously have craniocervical instability where we try to minimize any amount of bone removals, particularly when we're doing fusions. And so if we can avoid removing C1, that's a huge advantage when you're trying to do a craniocervical fusion. It's a topic we'll address at another time, but it's really about finding surfaces that can fuse together and bone surfaces. So you don't want to remove bone. You want to leave as much bone as you can. Very. <laughs> Could you please discuss white matter abnormalities and upper motor neuron lesions? They've been suggested as causing spasticity and balance issues. Um, will lesions and white matter problems increase? Not really a Chiari specific question, it doesn't sound like. Um, more for a neurologist. Yeah, no. But you know, if the, if the, if the person who wrote in is looking for an answer, um, that's a specific thing that they should be looking at demyelination. They should be probably visiting a neurologist or looking at getting a spinal tap to look for those things. Those are not typically findings that are associated with Chiari, but certainly worth getting medical attention for. Okay. So I'm going to play with fire because a couple of people have asked about it. But has any research been done or is in the works on the effect of cannabinoids? So mar yeah. medical marijuana for Chiari, syrinx, CSF disorders, and pain that you know of. <laughs> yeah, no, I think um, a lot of people ask about this and a lot of patients um, are using various iterations of it, whether it's oil or, you know, the organic version. I think that addressing pain has really been where um, it's been introduced to the KRI population, whether or not it has any impact on um, CSF flow or results from surgery directly. I think and it's a good question for the CSF to think about. I think it's becoming more popular, and obviously as it's legalized in more states, I think more people are going to be using it. Um, if it's a way to minimize narcotic use, I think everyone should be on board with it um, as a way to improve quality of life and to, to minimize dependency. Um, but how it affects the central nervous system, I think, is something that people are actively looking at uh, in basic science ways, looking at how those receptors are activated. Um, but I don't know specifically of any research in, in Chiari, but a great topic. Any other questions? An easy one. Can you have Chiari without headaches but other symptoms? <laughs> <laughs> Answer from the audience? Yeah. Answer from the audience is yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah, well, I think, um, you know, we've talked about a couple of different scenarios where you can have uh, symptoms that don't include headache. We haven't really talked about headache a lot here, but a lot of patients have um, no symptoms and present with Chiari. So I think, you know, the logical conclusion is that you can have 
you know, symptoms without headache, but syringomyelia obviously can present without headache, and scoliosis can present without headache, and mm -hmm. lower cranial nerve deficits. And so it's, it is always listed as the most common symptom, but certainly it's not ubiquitous, and patients do um, find um, lots of interesting ways to present, so. I'm gonna sneak in one answer. more question, I'm sorry. Right. Last question. <laughs> Just because it's related. After decompression surgery, um, we had one patient write in. She had decompression, or I assume it's just she. That's presumptive. Um, and she developed headaches afterward. Mm -hmm. So what would cause that if they had not been present before? Well, this is coming full circle back to like a conversation at the beginning. So maybe it is a good way to end because I think that um, this addresses the question, what do you do after surgery if you don't get better? This addresses the question of you know, how much pre-surgery testing do you need to look for comorbidities? Um, it addresses that relationship between the patient and their provider and where do you find care after surgery. So it really touches on a lot of those things. Um, I think for, you know, the things that run through my mind uh, in terms of, you know, very loosely terming failed surgery or new symptoms after surgery would be looking very systematically at intracranial pressure, CSF leak, cranial cervical instability. Was surgery successful? Were there any complications? You have to kind of as a provider, have a laundry list in your mind of how do you systematically work through this from most likely to least likely, and try in a balanced way to work through them um, without overwhelming the patient. You say you can't send them for 20 different things, but based on the clinical scenario, gosh, you know, a lot of patients who I see who have symptoms after surgery, you know, you'll get a scan, you'll be like, hmm, maybe more decompression can be done there. And you sort of start with the obvious, was surgery done right? You know, you might say, oh, look, that scar is a little bit wide. Maybe, do you maybe think you might have cranial cervical instability because you don't look like you've healed? And I think maybe you've got Ehlers Danlos syndrome, um, or you've got an empty cell on that scan. Did your provider look to see whether you've got intracranial hypertension before you had surgery? And so you got to kind of use the clues and you sort of, you're active as a detective and you figure out your way down there. But um, it really does highlight kind of the ability to miss these things, the ability to um, get confused by the MRI scan and go down the wrong path. And it explains why not everyone does well from surgery. And I think, you know, we all have to continue to learn from that. Okay, so I think we're gonna wrap up. Thank you for everyone for sending in your questions. Thank you very and much. And everyone for coming. Um, thank, thank you, you for Dr. hosting. Oh, thanks. You yeah. did a great job. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Greenfield, for being able to answer all of them and welcome all of them. <laughs>